Rookie of the Year 1961, five-time Pro Bowler, two-time Coach of the Year, including one of only two teams ever to win 18 games in a season, including the Super Bowl. Four-time NFL champion, twice as a player and twice as a coach, member of the NFL's 100th anniversary team, and finally the subject of one of the most enduring SNL sketches of the early to mid-90s, Bill Swirsky's Superfans. I, of course, am talking about Michael Disco, or as he's more commonly known these days, Iron Mike Ditka. When it comes to credentials, there's not many players and coaches out there that can match up to Mike Ditka. And I'm not just saying that because I live within 15 minutes of two of his restaurants. Ditka's resume and hard-nosed personality made him a great choice to sell a football video game. And the decision makers at Accolade agreed, which is how you get to the game that we are reviewing today. Hi, my name is Dave and welcome to Zalagamoto, the channel where I'm out to collect and review not just the 36 American football games released for the Sega Genesis, but also the nearly 1,250 other titles released in the English language for the Sega Master System, Genesis slash Mega Drive, Sega or Mega CD, as the case may be, and finally the 32X. And yes, I know that it's 36 because I went through and counted them after watching the latest episode of Yesterzine, which you should definitely go do if you haven't already. Basically, if I can plug it into a Genesis, either by itself or some sort of add-on, and be able to read what's on the screen, I'm trying to get a copy of it and review it for posterity, with both looks at that original packaging and gameplay captured from original hardware whenever possible. So let's get on with that, shall we? Mike Ditka's Power Football technically exists in two versions. The version that we're talking about today for the Genesis and then also Mike Ditka's Ultimate Football, which was released for DOS. Why did Accolade change the name between the two releases? Well, it's unclear, but the DOS version does have some different options than the Genesis version, and it comes from a different designer, Gene Smith for the DOS version and Tim Wilson for the Genesis version. So perhaps Accolade felt the need to give the games a different name so that players wouldn't think that they were getting the same game, regardless of the platform. Both of those games were released in 1991, with the Genesis title specifically coming out in October in both North America and Europe, but unsurprisingly not in Japan, as was the case with most Accolade releases. The timing here is important because October of 1991 is still relatively early in the Genesis lifespan, with really the only football competition on the console at that point was both the original John Madden football and Joe Montana football titles, as their sequels wouldn't come out for another month or two for Christmas of that year. I've reviewed both of those games previously, in episodes 139 and 27 respectively, so I've got a decent point of reference for what Accolade was up against on the market, but having said that, Accolade also knew what the Joe Madden and Joe Montana franchises were bringing to the table, so I'll be curious to see what they were able to come up with in providing an alternative to those much more well-known series. Sports games for the Genesis not from Electronic Arts or Sega don't exactly have the greatest track record, and we've previously seen some abysmal examples of those that I really don't want to talk about ever again. But Accolade was responsible for the Hardball series, which was definitely the exception to that rule. So could lightning strike twice with Mike Dicka Power Football? Well, we shall see, but first a look at the Boris Vallejo adorned package. And this is my copy of Mike Dick of Power Football. And thankfully, this is the original release of the game and not the later video game classics re-release. Because, good lord, that combination on the border is awful. And technically, I suppose from a collecting perspective, the real release version is less common to see, but it's still readily available. If you just have to have every variation out there and are colorblind. This copy, like most Accolade first generation cardboard box releases that I've seen, does have print wear on the edges, but other than that, it's in good shape. That's one of the nice things about these Accolade boxes, is that even though they're made of cardboard, it's a sturdy cardboard, and they're not prone to crushing unless they've really been abused, unlike the Electronic Arts and Sega cardboard boxes that will compress if a butterfly lands on them. Along with the intact structural integrity, there's no water damage or sun bleaching, which is nice. As I mentioned previously, there are two variations of the box for this game, but regardless of which one you're looking for, 
Neither is currently in high demand, with the game going for around 10 bucks right now. I'm not sure if that's the normal no-one-wants-it sports game pricing, or if that's a bad omen for things to come. I guess we'll find out in a bit. As far as the front cover goes, Accolade really got one thing right with these releases, being properly licensed from Sega or no, and that's these fantastic Boris Vallejo paintings that they had commissioned for the artwork. Of course, Mike is visualized here as being just a tad more muscly than he was in real life, but that's okay, as it makes for a cool-looking visual. Of note here, I like how they told Boris to dance right up to that line of NFL intellectual property, as clearly Mike is wearing a Bears uniform with the blue and orange stripes, and you can almost barely make out the Chicago C on the side of the helmet, while the person tackling him is a Green Bay Packer. If you're not going to do a photo cover on a sports game, this is clearly the best alternative. Flipping over the back, and at the top there's mention of the Boris Vallejo poster sendaway offer, and I've mentioned this before, but I really wonder if any of those were ever actually produced, and if any of them still exist in 2023. Say what you will about the games themselves, I think seeing these posters framed and hung up would be pretty cool. Then right below is an obviously fake quote from Dicka of, 8 megs of power, that's how I beat up the competition. And as cheesy as that sounds, it is twice as much ROM as what shipped with John Madden Football and Joe Montana Football, so I have to give them credit for putting their money where the mouth is. The rest of the back is Accolade really leaning into the power portion of Mike Ditka Power Football, as all of the bullet points mention how powerful everything in the game is, and I can't really hate on that. I appreciate the consistency, and they chose some nice-looking screenshots to sell the game as well. Opening up the box, and the manual and cartridge are in decent shape, but what I have to mention is these set of oversized cards that not only has the cover art for six of their early games, or five, uh, but then also has stats and tips about each of the games on the back. I really like this concept, and I think it's a fun alternative to the promo posters that other companies would use. As far as the manual goes, it's okay, not overly long, and heavy on the text as opposed to graphics, but it does at least give players the basics on how to play the game, and the different game modes that are included, especially the four different pass modes, which is nice, as most other games only have two passing modes, and how they work may not be how you would assume if you were just to go based on difficulty level. Okay, that's the package for Mike Dicka Power Football. Let's hit the gridiron and see if Accolade was able to come up with a decent alternative to the big boys, or if this game is more reminiscent of Dicka's time coaching the Saints. On the surface, Mike Ditka Power Football isn't really all that different than most other football games of the time. It has no licensing of any kind, so you won't be seeing your favorite team names or logos, but it's pretty clear that the game is built to replicate the NFL team structure at the time, with conferences and divisions mirroring what the NFL looked like in the 1990 season. Along with not having an NFL license, there's no NFLPA license either, so any of your favorite players from that season won't be making an appearance, either, at least by name. Actually, the team's rosters are modeled after the real players, complete with appropriate player numbers. It's just fictional names that have been added to protect the innocent, so to speak. For example, the two main quarterbacks for the Giants that year, number 11 Phil Simms and number 15 Jeff Hostetler, are both included. They're just listed as number 11 Long and number 15 Gold, and so on and so forth throughout the rest of the rosters. Having both starters and backups is one of the unique features of Mike Dicka Power Football. At the time in other football games, you basically had teams that were made up of the starters for that team and no one else. Anyone who's ever watched any kind of sport, especially football, knows that that isn't realistic, and at some point during the game, you're going to have players swap out for one another, not just so that they can get a breather or possibly deal with an injury, but just because there's different packages and sets of players that are often mixed and matched depending on the formation and the play that's called. Some players aren't going to care about that at all, as long as they can play a game with a team that somewhat resembles their real-life counterpart, then it doesn't matter to them who they're actually playing with. And there's nothing wrong with that at all. That's their preference. 
But me personally, I definitely appreciate what Accolade was going for here, because while I certainly don't want to have to micromanage my team, I also want it to at least somewhat resemble what real football is like, and that means you're not always going to have your best players on the field, and will have to make do with the players that you have available, it's just part of sports. Unfortunately, like most things that are implemented for the first time, it doesn't quite work perfectly. The biggest issue I had is that players have three stages of fatigue. They can either be fresh, slightly tired, or tired. These levels are shown by dots by the players' names if they're selected at the bottom of the screen or if you go into the substitution screen. For someone like a running back or a receiver, it makes sense that they're going to get tired, and you'll have to swap them out if you want to have the best chance of winning. However, what I ran into was my quarterback getting tired as well. And sure, it makes sense, a quarterback is going to get tired during a game just like anyone else, but rarely do you see a quarterback get swapped out unless there's an injury. Again, it's a great idea, and it's something that other series would implement as time went on, especially as other titles started to have licensing agreements with real players able to be selected. It's just a feature that probably needs some tweaking, and if it annoys you, Accolade at least provides the option to turn both fatigue and injuries off individually. So if perhaps you just don't like the fatigue, but still want the possibility for players to get injured, you can have that. Once you've decided which team you want to choose and what game options you want to go with, you then have to make a decision about what type of game mode you want to play. Like in other football game series, there are two primary game modes, single game and playoffs. Each game mode is exactly what it sounds like, with single game mode being a one-on-one -on -one matchup with against either the computer, referred to as Mike Ditka, or a second player. Or then there's also a 16-team single elimination tournament featuring eight teams chosen from either conference that are chosen at random, aside from the team that you choose, of course. The playoff mode does have an interesting tweak, however, that allows a second player to play as whatever team is selected in the ladder to play against the first player, rather than playing the computer. I think I would have rather had what later games did, where players choose two specific teams, and then they play against the computer until those two specific teams find themselves matched up in the ladder. But again, kudos to the designers for offering a different option to players. Aside from those two game modes, there are two additional modes, Kicking Practice and Final Drive. Both of those are pretty much what they sound like based on their name. Uh, kicking Practice is exactly what it sounds like, with you getting a chance to try to make kicks in the Place Kicking minigame. I refer to it as a minigame because Place Kicking, as opposed to punts or kickoffs, is done in-game in a separate engine, so there's no potential for the defense to block the kick or receive a kick that falls short and attempt a return. This is an interesting concept, and it fits with it being an early sports title, but as I just mentioned, it is slightly flawed in all but arcade type presentations. However, it does highlight Mike Dick of Fire Football's unique brand of kicking, which utilizes a golf styled kicking meter for all types of kicks. And what I mean by that is that you don't aim the kick with a D pad, as you do in other games. Instead, you press the button three times once to start the power meter going up once to establish how hard you're going to kick the ball, and then once as the meter comes back down, and then depending on if you're early or late to press the button the final time, you will either hook or slice the kick to the left or right, which is where you get your direction from. Not being able to pick the direction you're aiming at without timing seems a bit weird to me, but I guess when I think about it, Tecmo Super Bowl is similar, so I guess it's not that out there. Final Drive mode also resembles its name in that it's the briefest of non-minigames, putting you in control of a team of your choosing with about a minute and a half left in the fourth quarter, down in points and needing a full touchdown to pull the game out. It's great for if you want to just have some quick action, and there's an interesting caveat that if you score too quickly, the computer still technically has a chance to come back if there's time left on the clock. I would have liked to have seen this game mode expanded, similar to how the RBI Baseball series has the situational game mode, or like how NCAA Football allowed you to replay classic game situations versus various teams, but at least it's included at all. I've talked a lot so far about what you can actually do in Mike Dicka Power Football, but what I haven't necessarily talked about so far is how you actually play Mike Dicka Power Football. And this is important, because with sports titles especially, 
If they aren't fun to play, a gamer is going to immediately just go to a different franchise. There's not much else to keep people around. There's no story, there's no endearing characters, and graphics that, at best, are just going to resemble another sports title. Well, I won't say that Mike Dick of Power Football plays poorly necessarily, but it is a little odd. The first thing that I noticed that seemed off about the game was the fact that even though it's a standard 11 on 11 setup, you can't control any of the linemen in the game on offense or defense. On offense, it makes sense as you would always be either controlling the person with the ball or the receiver, but on defense, controlling a lineman is a pretty common tactic in other football games due to their use in rushing the passer. It's not clear why this is, but in the substitution screen, the lines are treated as a single unit rather than individual players, so it's clear the developers just didn't think this was important, which is unfortunate, but it ends up not being that big a deal due to the next oddity that we'll run into. Passing in-game is handled via one of four different modes that can be chosen before you start a game. Beginner, Intermediate, Advanced, and Professional. For the first two modes in the game, when you hike the ball and then tap A to bring up your receivers, the game will stop while you iterate through each of your receivers, and then continue when you have thrown the ball. With the difference between the modes being that in Intermediate, you have to move the receiver to the ball manually. For Advanced and Professional, the game works the same way, except the game doesn't stop as you're switching through receivers. Not that odd, and seems like a good assortment of difficulty options, right? Well, there's just one problem. Rather than bring up passing windows, or have the receivers indicated by an arrow or some other label, the screen will shift and focus on the receiver rather than the quarterback, which means you never have any idea of how close you are to being sacked, or have the ability to possibly juke a defender to buy more time, which results in you just throwing the ball as quickly as possible and hoping for the best. It's not optimal to be sure, but it doesn't completely break the game either. That would be the fact that it's impossible to run the ball. The entire time I played the game, I only had one run play from scrimmage that gained yardage, and most of the time you're talking about at least a 3 or 4 yard loss. And the computer was just as futile as I was, so this clearly was a design problem with the game. Probably the best thing I can say about run plays in the game is that none of them have to be run plays. And if you don't press the button to hand the ball off and instead bring up your receivers, you can always run them as passes instead, which I thought was a nice touch. The graphics in the game were better than I was expecting, with the game definitely having a look that was on par with John Madden football. I'd say that perhaps the game runs slightly choppier than Madden or Montana, but not horribly, and it's certainly much better than the ghastly pro quarterback. This is probably achieved by Accolade cheating a little bit and having the bottom, almost quarter of the screen be dedicated to a status window rather than gameplay, but that's nitpicking a bit. When played side to side with Madden or Montana, I think most would probably pick one of those two titles over Mike Dicka, but it's not a huge difference. Which kind of begs the question, where did all that storage space go if it wasn't used on graphics? Well, I think the answer to that might be in the sound department, specifically digitized speech. The game has a decent amount of it for things like first down or incomplete, and it's all very good quality, so I'm sure that had to eat up some of the space. The rest of the sound effects, as sparse as they are, are pretty good as well. The music, on the other hand, well, it's fine. But the problem is, you're only going to hear one song that loops during games, and even if you choose the shortest game length of 3 minute quarters, a game is going to take at least 40 minutes to play. I think I can safely say that even the best song in the world is going to get old if you have to listen to it for 40 minutes straight. Thankfully you can turn it off, but then you're left with silence. There is crowd noise in the game, but you only hear it when they cheer after a good play, so most of the time you'll spend playing the game will be relatively quiet, uh, unless you're a psycho and don't turn the music off. To compete against J the Joe Montana and John Madden football series on the Genesis, Mike Dick of Power Football was going to have to be spectacular, something truly special. And unfortunately, it's just not which is why Accolade abandoned the license after just one game, 
leading to Digital Pictures picking it up and creating Quarterback Attack with Mike Ditka for the Saturn, which thankfully I don't have to review. However, it's not a horrible effort as it stands, and I think a sequel could have potentially fixed a lot of these issues. As a result, I'm giving Mike Dick a Power Football 2 stars. It's not a bad game, and if you had it as a kid, I'm sure you would have had some fun with it. But in reality, there's just no reason to play it in a world where Joe Montana football and John Madden football exist. Okay, and that's it for Mike Dick of Power Football on the Genesis. After playing the game this week, what comes to mind is that meme of the kid saying, well, I want so-and-so, and the mom saying, we have so-and-so at home, and it's always something that's not as good. And that's kind of like how Mike Dick of Power Football is compared to the better football games on the Genesis. It's like those better games in a lot of ways, it's just not quite as good. Next time on Zalgamoto, looking at the schedule, I think we need to do one more Master System game before the end of the year. I've got a few that I'm technically overdue for reviewing, but I haven't reviewed them yet because I still haven't bought copies of them. I, I'm, I'm working on it though. Instead, let's review one that I have already gone through the trouble of procuring from Europe because it's a European exclusive and it's a port of one of my all-time favorite arcade games. I don't know how in the world it's going to translate on an 8-bit console, but I've got my fingers crossed that it's decent and that its sequel on the Genesis will eventually be even better. Well, we shall see. Well, that's it for Zalagamoto episode 220. If you liked what you saw here and want to see more, please think about liking and subscribing if you are so inclined, as it will help more people see these videos. But most importantly, whatever you like to play, have fun and be excellent to each other. Later.